Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. On this show, we seek to share insights and experiences from the world's leading CIOs and transformation agents. So tune in if you're a CIO or an entrepreneur looking for inspiration. Welcome. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome, Kevin Switelia from Gannett Fleming. We are so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Lisa. It has been a little while since we last spoke, but I, I'm really looking forward to this. Well, I would like to tell everybody a little bit about you. So Kevin, he serves as the CTO for Gannett Fleming, and this organization has almost 110 years of architecture, engineering, and construction experience. In Kevin's role, what he does is he provides strategic alignment of technical investment with business strategy, and he fosters his technology information through the firm's consulting uh, business. Kevin has more than 27 years of GIS, which is Geographic Information System, and IT experience. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Design and Ornamental Horticulture from Delaware Valley College of Science agriculture and a master's in landscape architecture degree from U university of pennsylvania kevin that is really unique but i have to let everybody know though very important in 2019 kevin was awarded philadelphia's cio of the year orby winner in the ca uh, corporate category so we are amongst royalty here let yeah. everybody know that well we, um, we're, we're 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 peers in that you i see yours over your uh, right shoulder and you can see mine in the back here we, <laughs> we have to, these are things that we're very proud of it's recognition right. from our peers we've got our there flex we got our flex go. yeah. I love it. I love it. So, hey, Kevin, can you tell the folks that are listening a little bit about Gannett Fleming? Like, you know, what are what's Gannett Fleming famous for? What are your superpowers? Yeah. yeah so we have done some remarkable things over the last uh, almost 110 years. You know, we were um, design engineers for the alignment of the Pennsylvania Turnpike when that was first being laid out. We've built big infrastructure across North America. We at certain times we owned electric utility companies in South America. We've done work in the Middle East and Asia. It's really fascinating to look back at the history. Our superpower has been the fact that we're not a flashy engineering firm. We do extremely high quality work and we're really proud of that. And we're not in the forefront of the industry a lot of times, but we are constantly being asked to be part of large complex engagements where we can bring not just the pragmatism, I call it little I innovation, to everyday engineering, architecture and construction services. And that's what really separates us. It's the consistency of quality. And we stand behind that. And that's what's helped us weather two world wars, the Great Depression, several recessions, global disruption a number of times over the last 110 years. So that's what we're really proud of. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what I always like to do on these podcasts is start with a little icebreaker. Okay. So what we're gonna do is rapid fire. You're gonna get two options, Kevin. Okay. You gotta pick one. You have to pick one, no explanation, and we're gonna rapidly go to the next one. So. Are you ready? Is this like fruits or vegetables? Which do I like better? Yeah. <laughs> Something like okay. that. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. On prem or in the cloud? In the cloud. Steak or salmon? Salmon. Printing or cursive? Printing. I'm a Unit landscape architect by trade. I, Kevin, I, I, Thank you for you we are print everything here. You are not supposed to give an explanation. Oh, sorry, sorry. You just broke the rules, which is awesome because I have yet to have a person not break the rules. So this is great. I, I, I can't wait to give the award at one point. But here we go. We got to keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, uh, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Mac or PC? PC. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. Summer or winter? Winter. Star Trek or Star Wars? Ooh, Star Wars. 
Okay, on this one, I always let people explain themselves. Why Star Wars over Star Trek? I like them both. I just think that Star Wars movies have captured more of my imagination over the arc of so many sagas that they've seen play out than Star Trek, which occupies a much tighter time frame in my upbringing with the old, the original, uh, through the movies of the next generation. But after that, I just disconnected from Star Trek. I know there's lots of other series, but Star Wars just keeps coming and coming, and it's just amazing all the way through The Mandalorian. <laughs> awesome. That was perfect. That was perfect. You did great. Thank you for participating in Rapid Fire. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> you did good. You did good. Okay. Now let's get into the meat of things. Okay. Otimo, we're here. We're all about digital transformation. So we'd like to really understand, especially what our industry leaders are thinking. Mm -hmm. But you and I have talked a little bit about strategy as well. So what I'd like to do is maybe start with that a little bit. Um, and, and can you tell me a little bit when you hear strategy or strategic thinking, what comes to mind to you? And what does that mean? Yeah, I really think of it as future casting where we want to be in a specific period of time. And then reverse engineering, because we think of engineering, reverse engineering, how are we going to get there? and thinking of it in terms of people, process, and technology. Common in our field, we talk about people, process, and technology all the time. What I like to emphasize with our teams is thinking of people first, process second, and actually technology last. Mm -hmm. Usually we have plenty of technology yeah. options, but the people side of it is the most challenging in terms of vision, getting, to, getting people into the right mindset, and future casting where we want to be. I love it. That's, that actually is a beautiful way to think about it because uh, uh, people say culture, you know, will eat strategy for breakfast, etc. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of pulls that thread about, you know, the, the, the three legged stool and people being the most like could be the weakest uh, leg of the stool or the yeah. strongest. Right. Yep. I think of it always as a triangle. I have this triangle in my head, people process technology and it's people on top and process and technology on bottom. Love it. I love it. So let's take this talk about strategy and shift it over to digital transformation. Mm -hmm. So um, how, how do you align a transformation project with the firm or the organization's strategy? How does that work? Yeah, oftentimes over the last decade in business, at least private business, it's all about growth. We want to supercharge growth, and that could be organic growth, could be acquisitional growth, could be market growth, could be services growth. So for me, it is all about thinking, how do we help facilitate growth? And I think of it in doing a few different things. One is enabling, and the other is eliminating. Mm -hmm. So the two E's, if we think about enabling, we're bringing in better processes that people can use that have less resistance, less friction, as we like to say, less redundancy necessarily in terms of manual steps. In terms of elimination, we're doing the opposite. We're looking at what processes and technologies actually hold us back in terms of accelerating growth. So when you think about those two things, it's all about changing processes that people can use and getting them into the right mindset for scalability. And then you look at the technology that can help create those or fulfill those processes that you want to put in place. So growth and scalability, enabling and eliminating. I love that. The two E's. I'm going to remember. I can steal that. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's a good one. I really like that. So specifically though, in your role, because you're the chief technology officer, mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you play a part in like your company's long-term vision then tying all this yeah. together? Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's challenging. We may have strategic sessions or strategy sessions on a three-year basis for longer term, annual basis for shorter term. And it's in a business like ours, again, Fleming, because we're equally operating in architecture, engineering, and construction, 
it's often keeping my antenna up and really listening intently on the conversations in the room and what are pain points that people are experiencing, what are ambitions that they're expressing, and how do I think of the technology that their teams have available or emerging technology that I'm aware of that they're not that can help possibly accelerate that change. Because we are talking about change. Strategy and growth and scalability is all about managing change. So it's keeping my antenna up. It's processing lots of different inputs. And then it's it's kind of sitting back and digesting and connecting dots. I talk about connecting dots a lot. In our roles, our strategic roles, so much of this is about connecting dots of disparate information. And it's the conversations we have at work, but it's a lot of other things I read, things I listen to um, that are not necessarily within our direct industry, but could come from other sources. That is an excellent point. And, you know, one of the things you said there was, you know, how you might bring new ideas to your business partners. Um, But I imagine sometimes they bring things you weren't aware of on occasion as well. Yeah. So you have that spidey sense that you have, that you're talking about these Mm -hmm. complications, these insights um, that, you know, you bring to the, you make those connections from different sources. So you got to have good listening skills for your internal organization. Absolutely. We, you know, individuals in our seats can't know and be aware of everything. The trick is to put ourselves in a position to hear or find out these things and garner relationships with people that will allow them to freely, openly, and in a trusting way, share intelligence they may have. And also asking good questions. I'm a big believer in asking questions and listening to the responses to get that input into this nugget, this processor we have up top. I love that. That um, And there's a, a lot of talk uh, and out in industry right now about the art of being curious. So Mm -hmm. I love how that ties into your, you know, asking good questions and um, listening to your business partners. Um, So good stuff. Now I want to, I want you to think back on transformations that you've experienced Um, could be any, any of your experiences. What are some of the biggest challenges or if you have an example or a bucket, mm-hmm. I think you kind of hinted to it already, but maybe yeah. there's something else. Uh, what are some of the biggest channel or the biggest challenge you've ever faced um, when you're when you've executed a transformation in the past? Yeah, so our I did say our company was an engineering firm predominantly. Right. And, you know, I'm married to an engineer. She is incredible, but she has a very similar mindset in, in the engineering disciplines you have change resistance that comes in many forms, but there is change resistance in the DNA of an engineer because there's this equation I like to talk about. For an engineer, change equals unknown. You don't know what it's going to be like. Yeah. Unknowns to an engineer equal risk. Right. Risk equals bad. So by extension, change equals bad. And you have to help them overcome change resistance that is hardwired into their DNA because so much of engineering is about repeating known predictable processes that provide known predictable outputs. And so innovation in the engineering disciplines is almost an antithesis. You have to really encourage business experimentation and encourage small scale innovation, small scale experimentation that they can accumulate over time to help them see little changes are safe. Little changes can still provide predictable outcomes and emotionally and psychologically that helps them walk through. This is what I do now. I see what I will be doing and I can make peace with that because I push a button and it comes out with something that I can now predict. It gets there a different way, but that change mentality is the biggest challenge we have in, I believe our entire industry. Um, Translating change to bad, trying to defeat that. I love that. So you have to have a mindset knowing going in that 
this is going to be one of your biggest roadblocks or things that's holding you back, holding you down, um, keeping mm-hmm. you keeping you grounded. Um, so, and you talked about how you use you know small incremental wins um, to get them conditioned to it's okay to put your toes in the water. You know, that's it's right. Not, it's not it's not so bad, right? Your test tips, try it out. Yeah. For me, you know, we use a, a change management philosophy in our organization that's predominant in the industry and, and in other industries. Uh, it's based on ADCAR. It's A-D-K-A-R, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement, where you go through that timeline with people, you make them aware, you give them a reason to change, you give them the knowledge and how to do what they need to do differently, and then you just reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. And that helps coupled with my role as I often say, chief cheerleader, chief salesperson, chief internal marketer of change, more than lots of other executives that are more, let's say dictatorial, you must change. We're Mm -hmm. trying to facilitate change and we're trying to be patient and forgiving. So I'm tapping into patience, forgiveness, but also my sales background for a big portion of my career with the company in doing consulting services and sales. A lot of those skill sets come back to daily use now with individual conversations. How do I convince something to do somebody to do something differently? How mm-hmm. do I be patient when they struggle? And how do I forgive them if they resist and resist and resist? Then ultimately, Peer pressure is a great thing. When you get a groundswell of peers that actually make a change and they say, look how good this is, they influence their peers. Yeah, you want to jump on the bandwagon if the bandwagon pulls up and there's lots of people in it, right? And it looks fun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's really good. And who would have, you know, we're talking technology, we're talking transformation, but we're really talking not about technology at all. Yeah. Really not. Psychology communication, you know, motivation. These are the mm-hmm. things that, you, you know, you're bringing up are the most, like, the biggest challenge. It's not whether or not to pick one product or another product or one solution over another or one business model or another. It's mm-hmm. it's people element. And that you being the head of technology, it's not, you haven't once on this conversation talk about, you know, your, your technical background or technical chops or, yeah. You know, that that's amazing. Um, the and technology it, is the easy part. Yeah, it rings true. I love it. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit, though, uh, because this often happens with the transformation. Mm-hmm. You have people that their cheese have has been moved. Mm. The way they did things is not the way they're doing them in the future. Mm-hmm. Talk about upskilling, retooling you know, maybe even replacement. How how does that fall and what's your role in, in assessing that and making that happen? Yeah, yeah. So we're definitely partners with our learning and development team. You know, we look at career development, person development, the whole person and understanding that people learn in different ways. So we cater to different learning styles. They read, they do, they see, they watch. Different people need to consume information different ways and different people need to enable themselves and and learn to do something differently. And there is generational workforce differences in how people assimilate information and how they like to assume a new process. So we offer different channels of learning. You have documentation that somebody can walk through stepwise. You have courses that show you how something is done. You have interactive sessions to allow people to follow along and take actions as the instructor is virtually doing it too. So various different ways to learn a new skill and giving them multiple opportunities to take bite-sized chunks, you know, reiterate, this isn't the only time we're going to teach this. We have three of these workshops or drop-in hours to do. So talking tactics here, it comes down to understanding different learning styles, different ways people need to have things reinforced. Some people will get in the first try, others need three or four times, but giving them options and availability for ways to learn and then just continuously reinforcing, as I said before. 
I like that. Um, so and that one more thing. With, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, just in time training. You know, we've really moved over the last decade into much more just in time training, especially on tactical training. You're not getting a course on what's coming a month before you're going to apply it. You're getting it two days before you start to use it on a new project or maybe a week so that you can instantly start applying those new skills, that new knowledge, the tool that you're learning how to do in the new project. So the whole evolution of um, scheduled courses to just-in-time training, I think is really interesting in our industry over the last, uh, certainly the last five years. That is so important. Um, I'm just thinking it back in my past, I was a technical trainer at one point and just-in-time training was something somewhat new back then on, on mm -hmm. how to implement that. But you are a hundred percent right. How many transformation projects have you seen where, you know, there you get the training and then, cause you think it might go live on a certain date and then, you know, inevitably yeah. it pushes to the right, pushes to the right. And then you have to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Or you think you're done and you're not quite done. And then, you know, then it's disaster on day one when no one can remember how to log in. Yeah. So, so when you're looking, you said something at the beginning of, of the training element where you talked about the whole person. Mm -hmm. You use the term the whole person. Yeah. How does um, continuous learning and and like that whole person development, you know, what's your approach to that? So oftentimes we're being asked to provide the technical content of learning a new tool or a new process, but we have to understand that there is a support system that needs to be put in place. Sometimes that support person is the person themselves needs to have access to material that helps them answer their own questions. Frequently asked questions, technical documentation, videos of a process or a tool, but then there's the team that they're going to be embedded in. So looking at how we promote teams or groups of individuals, cadres, that are going to go through this training process in a team-based fashion so that they can reinforce each other. We are tribal. We work in teams. Yep. Very few of us work in a complete vacuum by ourselves on assignment that is just given to us and we complete it and then hand it in. Most of us, especially in our industry, are working on larger teams and we have to work together. So thinking about how do we implement that philosophy I love that. I love that. It, it's really more there. You have to have so many lenses on that mm -hmm. training element. So, yeah. um, and like you said at the very, very beginning, everyone consumes information and learns differently. That's right. Um, and as adults, you know, we, we definitely have our preferences. So that, that beautiful stuff. All right. I have one final question before I let okay. you. Go. So if you had to go back in the way back machine, yeah. Okay, and you're faced with yourself, your your 20, 21 year old self. And what advice would you give yourself to prepare you for the road that you already have traveled? Wow, I would say contemplate more on how you emotionally and psychologically mature. So I'm a big believer in emotional intelligence. It was introduced to me a little over a decade ago at this point, and it completely, the concept and a framework and a model I could apply on a daily basis really changed my career trajectory, I thought. I was blessed with opportunities to learn lots of technology and technical capabilities and apply my intellect, but emotional intelligence and the concepts, if you're really embracing them, completely changed how I communicate with individuals, how I collaborate with individuals, how I motivate individuals, how I motivate myself. You know, emotional intelligence is about knowing yourself, motivating yourself, changing yourself, knowing others, communicating with others, motivating others, and then managing through risk and crisis. I don't believe I could have been successful without being exposed to emotional intelligence and really truly embracing it. And had I had it probably maybe a decade previous or uh, uh, further back in the way back machine, I'm wondering where I would have been and would I have had those personal failures or individual professional failures 
that I experienced during that time frame before I really knew myself not. And it's helped my private relationship with my love, my wife, uh, my kids, family. Uh, it's helped in the community with soccer coaching, with church community activities, and it's absolutely helped in my professional world. Yeah, so emotional intelligence, it's not anything to do with technology. You, If you are dogged and curious, you can teach yourself lots of technical skills. Right. It's the emotional intelligence side that I think a lot of people struggle with. That is a wonderful way to end this podcast. I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me and Otimo and the and the community of folks who watch uh, this podcast. So uh, beautiful nuggets from double E's to, you know, eliminate and uh, enhance to uh, emotional intelligence. What a journey. So thank you, Kevin, so much uh, for being here today. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lisa. I always love talking to you and uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and chat a little bit. Likewise. Goodbye, everybody.